the same time, probably also feeling like it was 100 years ago, um, at, you know, in the way that time has and in, in the way that we often think about time. And, of course, in the big scheme of things, it really is a blink of an eye, uh, the, the whole way in which uh, everything has happened since then, so much is happening today, um, and uh, the way in which that war shaped um, and influenced all of our um, politics, certainly in Europe, certainly in the Middle East, certainly in the United States, um, and in many other parts of the world, including, including Russia. Um, and this war also was fought on the basis of there being um, supposedly weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And the term WMD became a household name. I mean, everybody talked about WMD in Iraq. And uh, we're very fortunate to have with us Mohammed al Baradai, who I'm going to kick off uh, our discussion with. Mohammed, um, as you all will know, is the um, Emeritus uh, Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. He was Director General um, of the IAEA from December 97 until November uh, 2009. He was right in the eye of the storm. We saw him regularly. Mohammed, I'm watching on the screen now and I'm taken right back. You don't look a day older, by the way, Mohammed. Um, uh, to that time when you were on our screens every day, along with Hans, speaking before the Security Council, trying to explain to people what was happening. Um, and for those efforts, in part, um, you won with the IAEA the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005, and you were um, given the um, accolade as the unafraid advocate for nuclear nonproliferation from uh, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. Um, and, and indeed, you've won so many prizes over the years, I can't, I can't list them because we would completely uh, spend our whole time um, hearing those. But um, you originally trained um, in, in law, and um, you have a PhD uh, from the International uh, Law Department at New York University School of Law. Um, and you've, you were also a professor in international law before you went into the diplomatic service and then into the IAEA, IAEA, IAEA a, a very illustrious <laughs> career indeed. And you're known as one of the, you know, the great intellects of, of the uh, non-proliferation world. So, Mohammed, I welcome you. I thank you very much for joining us here today. I know you're going to reflect a little bit on what Hans might have said as well. So, um, you know, try, try to distinguish, if you can, between what you would have to say and what Hans might say, because there, there's not always the same thing. So, Mohammed, over to you. If you could start with your reflections on the last 20 years and um, the way in which we should be thinking now, perhaps, of what happened 20 years ago and the way it relates to what's going on today. Pat? Yeah. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you and with Lindsay today. Uh, uh, I wish, of course, Hans Blix was with us today, but I will try to do my best to reflect his views. Uh, we hail from the same perspective, so that makes it, uh, that, that, that makes it not difficult. Uh, uh, then what I want to do, Patricia, is more after 20 years, more than pin down who is accountable, who is to blame, I mean, that is part, but more importantly, how we can have an international system that works, how this disastrous war uh, could teach us a few lessons, and particularly, as I'm sure we will jump into at that stage uh, later on, is what's happening in Ukraine, you know? So we, we need to see, you know, have we learned anything? And, and B, what can we do? The, the war in Iraq was a brainchild of a group of, of ideologues. They call themselves the neocons. A chimera, basically, to shape the world in the US image, particularly after the USR fall down of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, it is scary, frankly, that after 20 years, 
as we are sitting here today, no one can pin down exactly the reason why this war took place. Was it a regime change, democracy spreading, WMDs, Iraq oil, extremism, Al-Qaeda? It's interesting because that Richard Haas, my friend Richard Haas, you know, who is, he was at the director of policy planning at the time at the State Department, and he's the president of the uh, 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 Council of Foreign Affairs right now. He said, and that was struck me to read, that I would probably go to my grave, you know, uh, or, or to my grave before knowing why this ro ro uh, the war took place. That is very scary and very instructive at the same time. Uh, he added that it seems no decision actually was made. It just happened. It, it reminds me of Donald Rumsfeld uh, when he said things does happen, huh? but it shouldn't be war <laughs> that that we we just go sleepwalking into wars and self destruction. Uh, Hans Blix, I should add here, he again he asked me to say that in his view, the WMD was just a pretext, was a sales affair, as he put it. Uh, the real reason, in his view, was crushing the axis of evil, and that was the main incentive: the Iraq, the the Iran, and the North Korea. But this was clearly a predetermined war based as now, as we see, very much on lies and deceptions regarding WMDs. Again, it was striking to me later as I read that Paul Wolfowitz said that the WMD is what they could agree on, you know, as a common denominator. They were both a group of people coming with all their different biases, but at least what they agreed on is to say weapon of mass destruction threat, and let us go with it. So it was not really, it was not really the, if you look at it, and it was not the, a serious pretext, if you like, but it was a rallying point for all these people who thought that after the end of the Soviet Union, you know, this is, has to be sort of a Pax Americana, if you like. It is very sad, speaking also here in England, that the UK was a major accomplice, an enabler in all the planning, preparation, and execution of this horrendous war. This is a different issue we can talk about later on. The bad news, however, that they hoped to use the inspectors, us, and MOVIC, the UN, IAEA, to legitimize their plan. That was bad for them and was bad for us. From an international order perspective, and that's really what is more important to me, it was like a bull in a china shop. A rogue behavior, completely rogue behavior. They violated every aspect of international order. They violated international law. They disregarded the Security Council. They disregarded international inspections. And again, I should add here what Hans Blix told me to say, that the US and the UK, including Blair and Rice, were on notice that the WMD case was weak and turning weaker with more UN inspection. That's exactly Hans Blick's input yesterday. What is really concerning is that there has been zero accountability. The Shilkut report, proper and eloquent, but no one was really held accountable. No criminal charges were made. 
in the US, there was a Senate Intelligence Committee conducted an investigation, which again pointed to major failures in intelligence gathering and the way it was handled. But this was the end of the story, as far as I know. It basically both from both sides saying, oops, we made a mistake. But aside from the technical individual accountability and or absence of it, we haven't seen any effort to learn from the mistakes to avoid its repeat. And again, we are in the middle of another war right now, maybe not on, on the base of weapons of mass destruction or pretext is different, but we're still in the middle of another war in Europe. And it is disconcerting when I see that some members of the intelligence community, Sir Dirlaf, for example, basically saying that it was the incompetence of the inspectors. Or another point that it was some of the weapons were where it went, went to Syria. I mean, that is really disconcerting to me, with all due respect to Sir Dillard, who is, I know. Uh, then we haven't learned anything, unless we own up, unless we own up to the horror, to the mistakes we make, then we are, we are going nowhere. He also said that the Iraqi knew in, in defense of his idea that uh, the inspection were incompetent. He also said that the Iraqi knew before the inspection, you know, where is the target? And again, Hans Blitz was very surprised yesterday to hear that. And he said that the target for an inspection, particularly chemical, biological, and missile, were given very, very late notice, and it was not electronically. So the Iraqis could not have known. And even if, if they would have known, there was no weapons at the end of the day. There was no weapons at the end of the day. I should, you know, when I talk about accountability, I, again, it's, it's, it's very sad that we don't talk about the human cost. To me, the human cost, it just, it does really, I don't know how to describe it. When I, I we haven't even made a, a, an accounting of how many people died. You, you, I saw 150,000, 200,000, 300,000, a million. I saw, and I know, lots of kids who died because they didn't have access to medication. But this is another issue, not only the accounting. It was the horrible sanction. And that was a Security Council. The dumb, whatever you call it, a dumb sanction, a horrible sanction, but it was sanction that was targeting the civilians much more than targeting, than targeting the regime, who actually made some money out of it. Has we done any reparation to the Iraqis? Have we told them we regret, we apologize, we are ready to deal with you as human beings? We haven't done that. If I may um, interrupt you at this stage and, and turn to Lindsay Hilson. So, Lindsay, I mean, you, you're the Channel 4 News International Editor, and you've carried, uh, covered so many conflicts, Syria, uh, Ukraine, and of course, the, not conflict, but rising of the Arab Spring, and so on. But you were in Baghdad for the 2003 invasion, um, and you were also in Belgrade for the yeah. 99 uh, NATO bombing. Um, you were also um, uh, the only English-speaking correspondent in Rwanda when the mm. genocide began. You, people might associate you with quite a lot of the starts. It's not my fault. <laughs> not your... <laughs> it's, it doesn't um, happen because I'm there. And, and, you know, so you've got this extraordinary perspective of, of, you know, how these things begin. When you were there in Baghdad in 2003, listening mm. to Mohammed now, 
you were you know, also following what was happening with Hans. And I think Mohammed has rightly uh, talked about the differences between the, what the IAE was able to do in terms of nuclear and the continuity of inspections compared with the chemical, biological missiles that Hans was dealing with. And the inspectors found missiles when nobody else knew they were there, right? Mm. That gave me a lot of confidence in the inspection process. And I know that Hans was very concerned about where was the missing bioweapons uh, capability, which I think we now have a better understanding of how that was got rid of. But at the time, Lindsay, how did you deal with all of this information that was coming at you as a journalist? How did you sort it out? And have things changed over the last 20 years? So thank, thank you, Patricia. And, and Thank you, Mohammed. So I was thinking this morning, as many of us were, that you know this day exactly 20 years ago um, was the day it started. And so I was on the 11th floor balcony of the Palestine Hotel watching the shock and awe bombing, and uh, and the the secret uh, Saddam's secret police coming in and having to hide our camera under the bed and all of this stuff. And then I was. Also, one year ago in Kramatorsk, when the, uh, the Russian invasion started, so we're talking about what governments have learned. I've clearly learned nothing <laughs> since I still seem to be going to the, these places. Uh, but before, before that, that moment, I spent a lot of time um, chasing Hans Blix and Mohammed Baraday around um, Iraq, because this is how it worked. That the in Spain, Mohammed, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So through 2002, I was there in 2002 as well as in 2003. So they would um, decide where they were going to go to inspect a facility, and we, the journalists, were in our vehicles outside the UN um, office. And then the convoy would come out, and we would chase after them, like the sort of Keystone cops, <laughs> like this, to see where they were, were going until we got to an Iraqi roadblock um, where the Iraqis wouldn't let us go any further. And then we would pepper them with questions afterwards, and they wouldn't tell us anything. So it was quite frustrating as a journalist. It was really hard to find out what was going on. And in fact, I, I um, was looking at my, my notes, um, and that in just on the 7th of March, um, 2003, uh, weapons inspectors went to Al Azizia firing range, where the Iraqis say that in 1991 they buried the entire arsenal of biological weapons, anthrax, botulinum, and aflatoxin. Uh, we were stopped of soldiers on the way. The 12th, remotely ah, the remotely piloted vehicle at the Al Taji military facility. And you know, these were the kind of things that so the, Rumsfeld had been talking about this remotely piloted vehicle which could spray chemical and biological weapons and how dangerous it was. And the Iraqis actually took us there. These were, they were basically made of balsa wood. They were these little planes which were like the forerunners of drones. The Iraqis had advertised them. They tried to sell them at an arms fair sometime earlier. And um, they had... They had little engines, the fuselage, they had a sort of small fuselage and they had engines which were what the American journalists called from a weed whacker, which means like a lawnmower. And that's all they were. And I can remember one of the Iraqi journalists I worked with came out to me and said, Lindsay, this aeroplane, very big problem for Americans. And I said, seems so. And yet it was clearly nothing. But for us as journalists, it was extremely difficult to sort this out because the inspectors, because they were sworn to secrecy, could not tell us what they, what they found. And I can remember another occasion in 2002 when one of the dossiers came out and the Iraqis had said to us, you can go to... You can choose two places to go to, which is mentioned in the British dossier. And we chose two places. One was biological weapons. That turned out to be a... Um, it was a vaccine manufacture place, which had WHO and UNICEF stickers on it. And the other one was a phosgene plant. And so we were allowed to go to this phosgene plant. But I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a chemist. I'm a journalist. So it's very hard for me. I can film. I can talk to people. But it's hard for me to know. And I can remember calling on the satellite phone the late David Kelly that evening and describing what I had seen and saying, what do you think? Do you think this is real? But I think that may give you some of the idea of how difficult it was for us as journalists to understand what we were seeing. 
because our intelligence agencies had told us that these were chemical and biological weapons. So I'm going there, you know, and I have, at the beginning, I have no reason to disbelieve them. And by the end, of course, it was, it, you know, it was impossible to even. But I, I suppose one question I would have for Mohammed is, I am so frustrated that they did not talk to us. Mm. And I'd like to know from Mohammed whether you think that you should have talked to us and told us what you weren't finding. So, Mohammed, perhaps you can um, uh, respond to Lindsay, because my memory at the time was how politicised things were in the UN and how difficult it was for you and for Hans and how careful you had to be in the so, UN. So perhaps you could mm. respond to Lindsay's question about why you, were, you felt unable to talk to journalists. And do you, do you feel now that perhaps it would be different today, that, that perhaps you would be able to in today's world? Why didn't you talk to journalists? Patricia and, and Lindsay, we were, we were just two individuals, Hans Blex and I. We had to handle just about the whole world. We had to handle the entire UN. We had to handle the Security Council. We had to handle NGOs. We had to handle journalists. We had to handle everybody. We tried our best. Don't think we wanted to get our story out, in fact. You know, we were also frustrated because, as you are saying, Lindsay, at the beginning, you know, it was we were just a couple of months in, in Iraq after four years of hiatus. And we went to, and we were very cautious. Hans and I were very cautious. We could not just say everything is clear until we know that everything is clear. And Hans even had a much more difficult uh, task because he was trying to prove the absence. While in the in case of nuclear, there was an environmental sampling and we had signatures, you know. But a couple of things when you talk about speaking about the media. Uh, one of the major issues was the Niger, uh, Niger uranium, as you remember. Mm -hmm. And it took us like two or three months to get the papers, you know, after Bush said in State of the Union that, you know, uh, that Iraq is importing uh, uh, uranium from Niger. It took my, you know, our people, my colleagues, at least a couple of months you know, we were given the run around, frankly. You know, uh, we don't have the paper, another intelligence might have it, you know, uh, what have you. Then finally, finally, Jack Boat, my brilliant, you know, uh, French uh, inspector, got it. It took him less than a, an hour to discover how crude that was. So we just discovered from our side, at least, that deception, that this could not have gone through different filters to go all the way to uh, President Bush, State of the Union. Yeah. Another issue I can tell you about, uh, about how we started to feel the deception. We went, Hans and I, to see President Chirac, and that was in January, Jack Chirac. And we were complaining, you know, uh, where is the beef, basically? You know, we can't find anything. And I still very much remember Jack Chirac words. He said, you know why you don't have any information? Because they don't have them. And that was the president of France, you know, a NATO ally, a Western major country, telling us at the same time that there is no, there's no weapon of mass destruction. So we started, so it was, uh, if we didn't talk enough, Lindsay, we are sorry. We, but I can also tell you, you know, when when we finally got the Niger story correct, the Niger story correct, I reported that in March, I remember, 7th of March, just a couple of weeks before the war. And I said to the Security Council, this is not authentic. I remember I tried on the plane to find a decent word, a euphemism. I could have said this is horrible, this is absolute junk. But we agreed with my colleague on the flying to New York to say, not authentic, very bureaucratic word, but just 
not to embarrass those who provided this. The, you know what happened after that? There was a wash. I mean, Washington Post report saying this is irrelevant. This is not really an issue. And one of my favorite newspaper, the New York Times, buried it in page thirteen. Buried it the next day in page thirteen. So I saw a lot of chair leaders journalism. I saw a lot of chair leader journalism, and that's an issue also. We need to keep in mind now, as we talk about Ukraine, how the, the, the AMA, you know, you want to suck up to the authority so you will continue to get information. And, but as a result, as a result, you continue to play a cheerleader role. And it, 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 it is disservice to everybody, to, uh, to transparency, to the international community, to the people, to people. And so our, our, experience with with the media was not great uh, particularly i should say not on people on the ground but particularly the major newspapers who are shaping public opinion they were in addition of course as you remember hans and i i mean we were we were mocked around in many many articles hans as a blue eyes uh, swede uh, mohammed al baradi as an originally arab and bias i mean we got we got lots of lots and lots of junk basically trying to do our job, basically trying to avoid a war, basically trying to assess the risk. So there's lots, lots of lessons one can talk about. Yeah. All good, all good points. Yes, I'd like to, to, to bring that now to today because I think, you know, Lindsay, you're now covering a very different war. Mm. Mohammed asked the question. You know, I, I mean, I, we all know that, you know, there were several resignations of people in in journalism because of the lines that they were being mm, told to sure. take. You know, very um, upstanding, uh, thorough, careful journalists were put under a lot of pressure as well. Um, I think we know as well within governments and intelligence services, a lot there was a lot of strong feeling um, and a lot of distress. Um, today, Lindsay, is it, is it very different today, covering well, the war in Ukraine? No, look, I mean, I was, I've never been put under any pressure to say anything ever, I should say that, for yeah. Channel 4 News. I think that what, what I reflect on most is, I mean, the, the, sort of, the headline of this um, panel is what have governments learnt? And to me, the most important thing is what the Russian government learnt. Because the Russian government echoes the language which was used by the Americans and the British in Iraq. And that, to me, is the critical thing. So, uh, mm -hmm. in... They even talk sometimes about the Ukrainians possibly having biological weapons, yeah. chemical weapons. I've heard that. Radiological they're, they're weapons. Radiological weapons. Yeah. This is yeah. all kind of raised and floated, you know, as a reason to justify the invasion. In 2014, when I was in Crimea and Donetsk, the, it was a humanitarian intervention because the Russian-speaking people are being persecuted by the Ukrainians. That was how it was justified. That absolutely echoed the whole language of humanitarian intervention, which was there in the background and there as part of the Iraqi um, invasion, as well as the weapons of, of mass destruction. So this whole idea that you are invading a country in order to do the people of that country a favor is something that, the, uh, that you're there to, to liberate them. I mean, the Russians talk about the liberation of Ukraine from its you know, Nazi government. Now, all of this is taken straight out of the American and British playbook from the Iraqi invasion. So to me, this is one of the most important things to understand is that we, inverted commas, and by we I mean Western uh, governments, Western countries, invented this language or used this language which can now um, be employed by almost anybody to justify any kind of, uh, of intervention. And it seems to me that that is one of the greatest uh, damages apart from the damage done to the, uh, to the Iraqi people. And what about information itself, Lindsay? You, you know, you, you now have access, much greater access than you had 20 years ago, for example, to satellite imagery. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, if we'd had satellite, Im I mean, we there was satellite imagery um, from Iraq, but obviously, and then you go back to what Mohammed was saying, that uh, Hans Blix was trying to prove an, a negative, and satellite imagery wouldn't have shown whether this was or wasn't an active biological uh, weapons centre or not. But clearly, the intelligence that we've 
the, you know, we were, were looking at uh, in the run-up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine was, I mean, it was available to everybody on Maxar satellite technologies, and it was the uh, the Russian military massing on the border to the north and, uh, and to the east. And interestingly, I mean, intelligence agencies, West intelligence agencies know how suspicious we are of them because of what happened in Iraq. And they've been much more open um, on this than they have been in the intervening years. And I think that's for a number of reasons. First, they decided that to publicize intelligence was a policy decision. It was a policy decision that they hoped that they would deter uh, Vladimir Putin by saying, we all know what you're doing, we can all see it, it's obvious, don't do it. So that was obviously a policy decision on, on their part. And in the initial stages, um, I have to say that the, in, the intelligence that people like me got was incredibly useful because I can look at a, I can look at a Maxar satellite map of a Russian military on the on the northern border of Ukraine, but I don't know which brigades it is, or you know which battalions and what kind of weaponry they've got and all that kind of thing. So it was very useful, and I, and I think we have come to trust them a little bit more. Yeah. But we're also careful because now what we're seeing in Ukraine is much more complex. And I think now we've had to become much more aware of the spin again. So, for example, obviously the Western intelligence agencies and the Western governments want to big up how well the Ukrainians are doing and how badly the Russians are doing. Well, I've just come back. Um, I was in Vukhledar. I was not in Bakhmut, but I was on the front line. I've spent a lot of time there in the last... Yeah, it's a very complex picture. Not a lot of, you know, there's, the front line is not moving very much, and the big issue is casualties. And the Western intelligence agencies will not tell us how many Ukrainian casualties they think there are, whereas they are telling us how many Russian casualties they think there are. And so, in, and I am sure that they have an estimate for how many Ukrainian casualties they think they are, but they're not telling us. So, once again, we're, you know, I, we worry, or I worry, about how much to believe the intelligence agencies. It's a very complicated dance that we, that we play with them. Mm, that's a very good point. What I'm going to do, Mohammed, before I come back to you, I'm going to go to our audience mm. and get um, uh, some questions. I have some questions <coughs> online, too, because I have a feeling that the questions that are going to be asked, um, you're going to be... You're going to sp you're going to speak to, or do you want to quickly come back to Lindsay? Is that what you want to do? Yeah, I, I just want to quickly. I just want to very much emphasize what Lindsay is saying. You cannot have an international system for us and another us and another one for the others. You you know what is good for the good is good for the gander. We do not remember that. You know when I see what's happening with Ukraine. There's an invasion. In Iraq, there was an invasion against international law. There was no right of self-defense in either cases. The Security Council was marginalized and paralyzed. You know, the, 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 media, the media is again split, and you cannot separate the wheat from the chaff. And it's us versus them. The, the, the facts, as Hans Blacks again emphasized to me yesterday, we need the facts. People need facts. And intelligence, again, should not be politicized. Intelligence was very much politicized. Intelligence should be an objective assessment. You know, but it was it was tailored to a political objective. But I stop here, Patricia, because you want to go for it. But I, I agree with that, but I want to come back on one thing, which is one critical difference. So the Iraqis I knew many of them wanted the invasion because they wanted the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. And obviously, Iraqis I knew, who some who worked in the government and some who didn't work in the government, and we're talking mainly about middle-class um, Iraqis in, in Baghdad, and several of them said to me very quietly, and including people I met at the universities, we want this invasion because nothing could be worse than Saddam Hussein. And many of them had and they were wrong about that, but that is what they felt and what they thought. 
and many of them had spent time in prison and been tortured. Um, so we shouldn't forget that. And I never met a single Ukrainian who wanted to be invaded by Russia. So I do think that that is a critical difference. Mm. No, there is a, it's a very much a critical difference, Lindsay. But it raises a fundamental question. If you have a dictator, and we have so many around, around the world, eh, what price are we ready to pay in terms of human suffering, human casualties? to get rid of the dictator. You know, that's the question we need to ask ourselves because the, Saddam Hussein was a horrible dictator, was not the only one and is still around so many. Are we ready to sacrifice a million, two million to get rid of the dictator? That is true. I mean, it's a question. But P Putin is not invading to get rid of a dictator, right? So that's a very, very different situation. I would also say that the government, the Western governments have learned a lot in terms of information intelligence um, since 2003 because of the way in which they used intelligence mm. uh, to demonstrate what Russia was doing in the build-up for the invasion. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was absolutely <coughs> fascinating. We did see some of that um, in Iraq uh, with the build-up of troops, by the way. That was seen by um, satellites and also by, you know, uh, then we had very um, low, much lower resolution, spotty marge, for example, the, the French system. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we were able to see uh, some of the build-up that was amassing. And we also saw that in 91 as yeah. well. So uh, it's just got better um, now. But I am going to go out to our audience, um, first of all, if I could. Um, if I could go perhaps to the, to the back um, over there, please. Thank you. And I'm going to then go online. I have a, a couple of people I'm going to call on. Uh, Ruth Buller, just a member of Chatham House. Uh, my question relates to this different set of rules for certain countries versus other ones, and how much you think that's to do with recent fluidity of borders. So what I mean is, um, the US has probably had well-defined borders for over 100 years, the UK as well, and what have you. Whereas if you go to somewhere like Lviv, it's probably been a part of four different countries in the last 100 years, same with Jerusalem. So this idea of protecting the people, so if you go back to Czechoslovakia in 38, Hitler was protecting the Germans in Czechoslovakia. Putin is protecting the Russians in Ukraine the Palestinians being protected in Israeli land, Kurds in Iraq, etc., etc. If Indians or Somalians were being mistreated in the UK, you would never imagine India invading the UK to protect them, or Somalia invading the UK, or Mexico invading the states. If the Mexicans weren't being treated well, you wouldn't suddenly have a Mexican invasion. Mm. And how much of that is related to the fact that those borders have been stiffer during the lifetimes of the people that are still alive now? And it's probably the same in 38, I would imagine, because I imagine people who were in the fluidity of the German Empire were still alive in the late 30s. And so this idea of protecting people, you know, the people of Russia that are in Ukrainian land, the people of, I don't know if I phrased my question well, but... That's a good question. We also, well, so part of that then was the responsibility to protect agenda that came out. And yeah. you were in Rwanda and, and yeah. also... I mean, and, and also in Syria, Syria. where they didn't yeah. protect anybody. So there is a damned if you do and damned if you don't thing as well. But I think that what we learned from Iraq was that, you know, the, the perils of intervention and what we learned from Syria and Rwanda were the perils of non-intervention. So I'm glad I'm a journalist, not a policy maker. <laughs> this is not the answer to the person. But I think that in, in addition to what you're saying, I think there's, there's very good points, but the other issue is colonialism. And so there is an issue about whether you, uh, countries which invade other countries and whether there's a colonial mentality there. And I think you can certainly argue there was a colonial mentality when it came to Iraq, and you definitely can when it comes to Russia and Ukraine. So I think that goes along with that. David. Thank you very much. Um, David Hanney, House of Lords. Oh, uh, well, you know and, everything. Uh, Mohammed, what a pleasure it is to see you looking so well and firing on all cylinders. Um, one, two questions. First question, uh, do you, the panel, both parts of the panel, think that Saddam, in fact, contributed to his own downfall by playing for 10 years cat and mouse with the inspectors, preventing them visiting so-called palaces and so on, and creating the impression that he was hiding something, uh, which I think he probably did want to create that impression because that strengthened his hand in dealing with his neighbors, the belief that he could, he had some very nasty things he could do to them still. So the question is, do you think he contributed 
to his own downfall. And secondly, with the benefit of hindsight, and we now know that there were no uh, weapons, uh, when do you think he destroyed them? What is the best guess for when they were all destroyed? Hmm. I wonder if I might just respond quickly, David, because so one of the things that Saddam Hussein did is he taped almost all of his discussions in his cabinet. So there is, in fact, a body of tapes that are at the, I think, the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., that you can go and listen to and read the transcripts of, of all of these. Um, and one of the things that really uh, worried him was the, the likelihood of a reprise attack from the Gulf states, uh, led by uh, you know, Q8, but also the, the supporters of Q8. He didn't fear the Americans in the way that he should have done. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really fascinating. There's a lot of scholarship on this, which you know rarely makes it these days into the the, the media. But it's a, it's a fascinating uh, history. But perhaps Han, uh, Mohammed, you could um, reflect a bit on, on your work with Hans and trying to um, understand what Saddam Hussein was doing, because from 1998 to 2002, there were no um, UN inspections. There's still IAEA inspections. So perhaps you could talk a bit about about that um, and the way that was um, handled. Yeah, I, I think I think Patricia, uh, between ninety eight and two thousand and two, we had very very limited inspection. So you know, we just go to declare sites. So we could not really do very much. But on the question, did, did he really help himself? It's 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 a very complicated issue, and I. I it's clear that he knew that he didn't have anything, but he wanted to create the impression that they still have some some weapons. So it's a question to maybe it was as a self-defense, you know. And but that that raises another issue I don't want to talk about, which is if if you have nuclear weapons, does that work as your ultimate deterrence? That is a different issue. Why? And this is a question I hear all the time. Why is North Korea is not being attacked, you know, while Iraq was pulverized? But that's, you know, that's a different one. The other, the other issue, obviously, that, uh, yes, it, uh, you know, they, he thought that we eventually, since they don't have anything, they can relax. But the issue of dignity for, for the Iraqis was very important. You know, sometimes, you know, and and this is something I can I can talk about. Not us, but uh, Anscom at the beginning of the inspection. They went to the ch churches and and mosque on on the day on Friday or on Sunday for no reason. You know, so there was I mean there was mistakes from both sides. It is not you know we we at least uh, the, I, and and that's uh, as a result of that the Security Council completely changed Anscom and created Hans Blix and Movik because we wanted an impartial, a very sensitive, you know, but a professional inspection unit. In, in, in so far as I, we, I think we have been there doing this sort of thing for, for years. So we, we know that we have to be professional, but we have to understand also not to be aggressive and not to humiliate people. Uh, but Yes, a uh, uh, short answer that he, he didn't help himself. It was not really a functioning system. You know, as you said, there was no uh, council of, of, of uh, ministers. There it was nothing. It just, it just was a... But at the end, the, the, the question remains, do we, did we have any risk that required that we go in? That is at, at the end. Yeah, a lot of mistakes everywhere. But did, did we see the 48 hours chemical weapon you know threat that required that we go in you know this is this is the, the basic question i think you know thank you mohammed so i'm going to go to a lady at the back and then gentleman at the front and then to um um, Aus, um austin on online please as well thank you very much I don't know whether chemical weapons was the justification which would enable international intervention in a country or not. That is not my point. What I can say, however, is that this is not a discussion which is either or. I was there, and yes, Saddam had 
uh, chemical weapons in terms of mustard gas, and he was using it in the marshlands. I was uh, carrying out medical uh, humanitarian work with uh, properly qualified doctors. We actually brought three victims over here to St. Thomas's and managed to save two, but it's awfully difficult with mustard gas because the breathing almost disappears immediately, so it's terribly hard to save people. But yes, he had mustard gas. He had been using it intermittently for a number of years. Uh, he didn't have the same supervision on flying that he had that we had in the north in Kurdistan, and that enabled him to send up small planes and drop the mustard gas on uh, marsh Arabs. And of course, the first time I reported it to Geneva, Geneva took six weeks to get permission to come in and do anything, by which time the bulldozers had already been and turned the whole place upside down. So well, when, are you talking about, when are you talking about? What year? I beg on what year? Well, yeah, the first, I reported every time to the House of Commons, so I can give you the debates. The first year would have been about 1998, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. And the last time I reported it was 2000, just before the invasion, as a matter of fact, because I was on the ground, on the border, in the marshlands. Mm -hmm. And I reported that straight back to the House of Commons as well. So every time I found stuff, I did my very best to find a slot in the Commons debates and push something in. And at that time, the Speaker was very kind and very helpful, and Commons colleagues minded very much too. And 10 years before that, of course, almost exactly, we've just marked the anniversary of Halabja with the attacks. And 10 years before that, when they marked the anniversary of Halabja. Yes. Uh, yes. I was not in the north for Halabja. No, so we've just marked the anniversary. I can't tell Halabja. you about that. Yeah. I'm only talking yeah. about the Deep South. Yes, but the, we know, we, the thing is that um, Saddam had used chemical weapons in the Iran-Iraq war, they had used uh, in Halabja, they continued using against I pockets. was unable to, well, I wasn't unable to ask Saddam. I, I passed up the opportunity to visit him in his cell by the time he was captured, and I thought that was, he was clearly gone mad, and it wasn't fair to grill somebody who was on their way to execution anyway. So I did not ask Saddam what I could have asked. But yes. I did that because I thought it was Thank improper you. with someone already under death sentence to go and grill them yep. about their past activities. Yeah. So I can't answer that. I, I apologise. I'm going to go to, before going back to our panellists, I'm going to go to the gentleman in the front row and then to Austin Short online. So. Sean Curtin, uh, ordinary member of uh, Chatham House. I would say that uh, governments outside of the uh, Western uh, envelope have uh, learned to treat um, any war that the West wages with great scepticism, and this has severely damaged our um, soft power, especially when it comes to the way that many countries outside the Western envelope view um, the Ukraine war. Last year I spent a lot of time in uh, six different southern African states and I was very surprised that uh, a lot of the people I spoke to were, were spouting Russian propaganda, talking about the need to protect Russians and that NATO was a threat. And they used language similar to what was used to justify the Iraq war. And yeah. because we haven't invested, and Russia today, you can get it in any South African or Zambian TV and uh, the Chinese channels, that people actually have a, a view which is completely opposite to our one. So I'd say that's what a lot of governments of the world have taken away from this. Thank you. That's an important point. Yeah. Austin, can I go to you, please, for your question? If you could just restrict yourself to one question, please. I know you've put two on. Uh, uh, hello, uh, Mahraba. Um, I think my, I'll go with my first question, which I think is similar to what's just been asked. Uh, Saddam Hussein was clearly a villain. He used chemical weapons against his own people, as we've been hearing. He invaded a neighboring country and refused to cooperate with, with UN sanctions, um, uh, with, uh, with, with your mandate for inspections. Uh, yet the popular, popular narrative paints Bush and Blair as the villains. And has this narrative helped win support or ambivalence for Russia today? So, um, a lot of questions. Mohammed, if I could turn to you, please, um, to, you don't have to address every single one, but, you know, if you could give us your uh, reactions to those questions, it would be very helpful. I can't see you, Mohammed. I don't know what's... What, what is the question, Pat? Uh, so, the, 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 there were a number of questions. Uh, we had the questions about the use of chemical weapons. Uh, there were two yeah. questions about that, where essentially, you know, Saddam was no... 
um, Angel, right? And he was using yeah. chemical yeah. weapons. Um, he had used sure. them before and so on. And yet we keep painting Blair and Bush as the villains rather than Saddam Hussein as the villain. And then uh, the yeah. other point was about the framing um, of the, the way in which this language is used and how now this is often used around the world. So we've uh, what I would call an own goal where the, the West has created a framing for others to be able to use this language and, and act in a way that is detrimental to people. So. Sure. No, on, on the first question, Patricia, uh, of course, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein had a long rec record of deceit. I mean, since 1991, he invaded Kuwait. So we should put the things in context, you know. The trust was not there, obviously, and that's what, as I said, we had to do whether he, he was also using a chemical weapon in Halabja and other places. But the answer to that is a question of proportionality. You know, there is, a, as I mentioned, there's a lot of horrible governments around the world, still around. Are we going to go to war and every time they misbehave, or should we try you know, to tailor a response that is proportionate, that we might not end up destroying the whole country, you know, because somebody used chemical weapon in the field, for example, in, in the field. The other question, of course, use the rule. I mean, we talk a lot about rule-based system. The rule-based system has to, it, you cannot just go on your own and say, as I saw Mr. Bremer yesterday saying, in an interview, for example, when it comes to the U.S. interest, we do not need a U.N. authorization. Well, then you can forget about the U.N. system. Then you can forget about international law. You know, we need to have a collective security. We need to have a rule-based system as we have. It. Go back to the charter. If it needs to be adjusted, we need to adjust it. But the chaos we have right now that everyone can get away with murder because they have decided they are on the right side, well, we will end up self-destroying us. And I should, again, being somebody who spent years with nuclear weapon, the language, we, the loose language we see now about the use of nuclear weapons, you know, it's just horrifying. It just, it makes it more imperative that we have a functioning collective security system that is contained, constrained, controlled, and does not have uh, us to go into the final solution, which is use of nuclear weapon or, or chemical or, or, or other weapons of mass destruction. So, so may, I abuse yeah, my, may I abuse my position? Please. Because I want to ask Mohammed a question. To to you. I want to ask Mohammed a question. Good. What did you think? So when um, Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons against Syrian people in al Quta. Um, and Obama had set a red line, which was crossed, and then did nothing. What should have been done, or was it correct to basic to have that negotiation which they had, but which did nothing? Because the negotiation, it was supposed to be about um, Bashar al-Assad giving up his chemical weapons, but he didn't, and he used them again and again. Is 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 that? an easy question at, at all, you know, and uh, as I said, it, what is really important is to get a collective, I mean, the major power right now, they have to work together, you know, I mean, you have whatever you, Russia, China, you, EU, and the US, they have to find a way to function together, you know, there is no, after, forget, after the Ukraine war, before the Ukraine war, you cannot just continue on the policy of confrontation, you know, we all would lose, I mean, uh, irrespective of who's right, who's wrong, you know, what, you are right, you know, something should have been done, for example, in the in, in Syria, but it hasn't been done, you know, and the messages are contradictory, that in one case, we forget about it, on the other, we go in, I mean, you look at Libya, you go at Iraq, you go at North Korea, you go in different places, you know, but you have to have rule based, and that again, I should hope that that Hans Blix again continue to emphasize to me. This is the best we have: so a rule based system. 
and we should use it. In know. the case of Syria, the chemical weapons were removed by the OPCW. They were brought to different places around uh, the world and dismantled. The problem was they still had the capability to manufacture new... Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the capacity is lessened. Yeah, but he still lessened. used it after yeah. Kuta. And then he, and the, the negotiation nothing was done since. And he yeah. had by that time... Syria had by that time ratified the Chemical Weapons Convention, so they should be held accountable and indeed are in The Hague regularly, but then nothing happens. So our bigger problem is, as I think, um, which Dina, Dina Mufti has asked is, you know, has the uh, war in Iraq led to a breakdown in the international world mm. order? And I yes. think that's one mm. of the very big mm. questions. But I'm going to turn um, to um, Henry Dodd, please, and to Anne Dayton to ask questions as well online. We're going to go a little bit late, people, just so you're aware, because I think people really want to, to hear this. So, um, Hi. Henry. Hi, uh, I'm Henry Dodd. I work for the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. Um, my question is, how much do you think the framing of the conflict as being around WMD influenced the failure by the US and the UK to plan for a long-term commitment to rebuilding Iraq? And then Anne. Thank you very much. Can you, um, thank you for these very powerful speeches from both the speakers. But we should, I think, move our conversation as it is going towards the difference between the content of very different wars in, in Iraq and Ukraine and the processes. And my question for the two speakers is what advice would they give to governments to behave in ways that also have learnt from the past. Thank you. And then a third question. I think that will be the last question. Uh, please, Ian. Uh, Ian Martin. I'm a member of Chatham House. I've worked latterly for the United Nations, but I'm remembering now that I was working for Amnesty International at the time of Halabja, and we made strenuous efforts to get uh, the US and Western governments that have been supporting Saddam in the war against Iran to care about that. Uh, with almost no success. But Mr. O'Brien and I made a strong point about accountability and the lack of accountability in the context of Iraq. Uh, and someone in the UK government with a wicked sense of humour has decided that the anniversary of the invasion of Iraq is the right time to hold a major international meeting on accountability in the context of Ukraine. Uh, and we all know that one of the major problems in the global south regarding Ukraine is the perception of double standards. Um, Lindsay, I'm sure you are yearning to see accountability for some of the things you've seen on the ground, but how do we handle that particular obvious case of double standards? Great. Lindsay, do you want to begin? No, because those <laughs> questions are all too difficult for me. I don't give... I mean, on, on the first one, um, obviously, you know, in, in, in terms of rebuilding of Iraq, one of the unintended consequences is how powerful Iran became um, in Iraq, and therefore um, Western involvement has become very complex. And obviously then you've had ISIS and all the things that have, have flown, flowed from, from the war. So I'm not uh, completely sure how much... Uh, Western governments having invaded could could do on rebuilding because it's because um, it's been such a disaster. So that's the first one. The second one was advice to governments. I never give advice to governments. Um, and uh, the third one, Ian, on accountability. Look, we have a very um, patchwork system on accountability, don't we? And the best we have at the moment is the ICC. And one of the if there is anything good <laughs> just come out of it, I'm glad to see the ICC is no longer only um, indicting Africans, that now um, other people are also noted as having done things which are indictable, which is, you know, which I think is, is an improvement. But I think that one of the interesting things which we will see about Syria is that there's a wealth of evidence and um, there's been so much collection of, of evidence on Syria. And there are cases which are being taken in different countries, particularly in Germany, against some of um, Bashar al-Assad's torturers. And um, 
you know, I, at the moment, it, it is that kind of patchwork. But until, as Mohammed says, you've got a better international system, which involves the Europeans, America, Russia, and China, basically the great powers working together, I can see no way that you can create a coherent system. I think you can only, only have a patchwork, and it's very unsatisfactory. Mm. Mohammed, we were uh, we were asked about um, you know the whether or not the weapons of mass destruction had an impact on the um, preparations for post-war Iraq, um, and I'm reminded, of course, of the Chilcot inquiry and the way in which uh, that inquiry demonstrated the lack of preparedness for what would come mm -hmm. after the war. Sure. And I wondered um, at the time in the UN. My memory is that um, senior people were um, not allowed to talk about, UN officials were not allowed to talk about the post-war environment because that would assume that the war would take place <laughs> and there, there, were, there yeah. was no mandate for, for war. So they were in this, the UN was in this terrible bind. Were you part of those conversations at all? Can you shed any light on them? No, Patricia, that, that you're right. I mean... We were, I mean, the UN posture, official uh, position that we didn't, we didn't see a reason that whatsoever for any war. So we we were not talking about post post uh, war. Uh, but aside from the mess that happened at in the post war and the division along ethnic groupings and all the all the junk that took place, you know, uh, I think the question was asked about accountability and double standard. And that's where I want to focus. I mean, everybody now is saying hooray for ICC. Hmm? But this ICC, the International Court, Criminal Court, the, U the US is not party to it. Russia is not party to it. China is not party to it. India is not party to it. So it, it has become, again, a, a, a forum for the weak and defeated. But the powerful should not be accountable. Uh, and Again, as Lindsay is saying, unless we have a system, unless we have a system where all the major powers do as they say and work together and cooperate, particularly at a time when the nuclear threat, nuclear weapon threat is horrifying, unless we do that, we haven't learned anything. A question was asked about content. Have we learned anything? I haven't really seen that we have learned anything. I think we're, we're getting into a more chaotic world order right now, where, where the feeling that everybody can get away with whatever they want. When you talk about double standard, again, I look at different issues. I look at vaccine, for example. I look at vaccine. Here we are in the EU, 86% are fully vaccinated. We are. I don't know about you in the UK and the mess you created, but we are in the EU, 86% vaccinated. In Africa, it's 15%. You know, what message are we sending? You know, look at the refugees coming from Ukraine. I mean, they are one of us and they are welcome. But look at refugees coming from the Middle East. They are left, they are left intentionally to drown. So double standard is the mother of all problems, I think, as we have. And unless we have a system that is fair, that is equitable, I think we're not learning anything, Patricia. True. In the absence of that, though, what do you do? You know, do you not set up the ICC? Do you not set up international treaties that not... I mean, countries negotiate international treaties, sign them, and then don't ratify them, or then negotiate them and don't sign them. You know, what do you do? Do you just say, oh, it's impossible, or do you try to find a way forward? I think this is, as you said, Lindsay, you know, you, you can, you're an observer, you're a journalist, making the decisions is just so so much harder and we do make mistakes and what i see in the west is that there have been many inquiries into the mistakes that have been mm. made which i think is a really important part of democracy i want to end though because unfortunately we have to end um uh, with a consideration of what happened afterwards in terms of the iraq survey group so we had david Kay and then charlie dolfer and his book hide and seek is one of the best written books on, on all of this, I think, who then went into Iraq to find the weapons of mass destruction that you know the UN inspectors apparently couldn't find. And of course, they couldn't find them either, which I think is one of the strongest um, 
uh, uh, supportive pieces of evidence for how good the UN inspectors, the IA inspectors were. And when that happened, you know, many of them in the Iraq survey group had been in the IAEA, David Kay, for example, um, and, and or and Mavic or Unscom prior. So, you know, is there a, should there be, if there isn't already, a sort of international club of, of inspectors who are still around who can get together and perhaps advise future governments on how to do things this really well? And shouldn't you be leading this, Mohammed? You and Hans. Well, we, we try. I mean, but we are a cog in a big machine. And, you know, we can succeed as much as the machine is functioning. And we need to reform the UN. We need to reform the Security Council. We need to respect international law. We need the major power to talk to each other, including now in the case of the Ukraine war. We need to do all that, and then it will be much easier for us. But you know, as the little cog in this big machine, to function properly. So we will do our best, but we have to continue. As Hans and I are lawyers, I mean, we are lawyers. We, we care about the, we care about double standard. We care about rule of law. And as much as we continue to try to improve what we can do, we need to pin down the bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that we need a functioning global security order. Thank you, Mohammed. Lindsay, last words. And in the absence of having a function functional global security organ, as you say, what can we do? And maybe weapons inspectors and journalists are the same. That all we can do is find out as much as possible. Yeah. And so they can never say they didn't know, because they did know, because we told them. And on that note, we will end. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for being with us online. I want to say, uh, say a special thank you to, to you, Mohammed, um, for being with us. I really appreciate it. We're sending our best wishes to Hans and his family. Thank you, Lindsay, um, for everything you all, all did and continue to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat, for having us.